Okay, uh, this webinar is now being recorded. Dr. Kaiser, you may start. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, uh, I would like to thank everyone that uh, you're attending today's uh, fMRI webinar uh, on uh, how to improve safety mobility transportation from the Wedjo. Uh, it's a, a it's a company that can help you know agencies, state and federal agencies to create a better transportation uh, ecosystem and when now we are moving to the smart cities. I would like to thank the IT, ITFAU student chapter and uh, and uh, their, ad, their student advisor for the effort to put this event together. And today we have two participants for two presenters from the uh, WEDJO. One <coughs> is uh, Sion uh, Kwaeli. I'll try to try to pronounce correct. Sion is a part of the solution consulting team at WEDJO, supporting the traffic space and focus on the government and public sector marketplace, as well as working closely with the product and te technical teams uh, within the business. Prior to join WEDJO in 2021, Sion has spent many years in technical business development and training roles, most recently as part of the Samsung United, uh, United, United Kingdom team. Uh, we are talking also lately with Beth, uh, Bethany Haslam, uh, that is Public Sector Business Development Manager for Wedzo. Uh, thanks to her, uh, they, we got, I personally got more, more uh, information about this uh, great uh, company. Beth is a, is a led business development manager working with uh, government agencies across United States and Europe. <laughs> helping integrate Wedge's connective vehicles uh, data into their systems. Being with Wedge for over two years, Bethany is passionate about creating safer roads, reducing congestion and improving America. Transportation network with forward thinking technology. Uh, I think that are really important in our um, times and we are looking for smart cities, smart transportation. So Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So great to be here. Thank you FAU for inviting Weijo to present in today's webinar. Today we will be covering various topics including how connected vehicle data can improve safety, mobility and transportation within the public sector. To kick off with introductions, my name is Beth. Uh, I have been with Weijo uh, as Dr. Kaiser said, for two and a half years now, sitting in our business to government team. My role as a territory manager allows me to work with universities, state DOTs, cities, counties, and MPOs, and really collaborate and partner with organizations to better utilize WeJo's connected vehicle data. I typically manage the southeastern region of North America from Florida all the way up to Virginia and over towards Alabama. I find it incredibly rewarding uh, being able to partner with organizations and really make a difference to mobility and safety and see the results from data driven decisions. I'd like to hand over to my colleague Sean to now introduce himself. Hey Beth, uh, hello everyone. I'm Sean and I'm one of the solutions consultants here at Weijo, having been with the business for around 14 months now. Within the solutions consulting team, I am very heavily involved with the traffic space, including supporting our BDM colleagues like Beth in working with public sector organizations like yourself. Very pleased to be here today talking about how connected vehicle data can and is being utilized in your space. Um, Beth, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So, what is Weijo? Well, Weijo is the world's largest source of authentic connected vehicle data. We are a UK based company headquartered right here in Manchester. However, we are very much an international business with colleagues all over the world and global opportunities. I would say that currently most of our efforts focus on the United States as this is where as a business we've really hit the ground running and made some fantastic partnerships. I think there is a lot of different understanding of what connected vehicle data is. 
Some connected vehicles will connect to infrastructure like roadside units and sensors, and some will effectively communicate with each other. Weijo's data is a little different in the fact that the vehicles, uh, the sensors within the vehicles in Weijo's data set are already embedded uh, and connected. And we get the data directly from major car manufacturers through partnering with these manufacturers and being trusted with access to their entire fleets of passenger vehicles. So there are no onboard units in these vehicles, no plug-in devices, and we do not pull from external data sources such as mobile phone data or sensor data. What you're really getting is true, authentic vehicle behavior and movement. At the moment, we partner with four manufacturers in the States, and that number constantly grows as we have conversations globally with 17 manufacturers. This is a data source that is consistently growing and as more volume increases, we see more opportunities and more use cases. Uh, I think by having the relationships with the, the four car manufacturers in the States, this gives us access to around 13.7 million unique vehicles. Uh, so you can see on screen here some high level statistics on where we are so far with an average of 17.2 billion data points ingested per day, which is more data than the New York Stock Exchange. So by having access to a multitude of sensors from these vehicles, we can look at very interesting metrics such as harsh braking, seatbelt latch, external temperature and, and much more essentially. So. This information can inspire new research within universities and government agencies and can really make a difference to how an organization might view safety analysis based off data. Uh, and I'll be diving into these in a little bit more detail later in the session. I'd like to pass over to Sean now, who will be going through the process of how we get the data and also touching on privacy. Thank you, Beth. So, as Beth alluded to, modern vehicles collect a vast amount of data via their own network of sensors, which the manufacturer or OEM, as we refer to them, will collect through the existing 4G and 5G, 5G cellular networks into their own cloud infrastructure. Now, this could take the form of very granular location data or different event data collected from the vehicle sensors, all of which is potentially highly valuable to anyone who wants to understand what is happening on the roads. The challenges are that different OEMs will collect this data in different ways, often with varying attributes, and they may actually not have a model for validating their own data set. After the end of the day, they are automotive companies, not data specialist companies. This is where Weijo comes in. We have our own proprietary platform, Weijo Adept, into which we can blend the large amount of data from multiple different OEM partners direct from their cloud infrastructure into ours and turn it into one common data model. We validate the data, de-identify it for privacy, perform quality checks to minimize errors, and we can also enrich the data with additional attributes if required. So for example, we could add a time zone offset for different locations or a zip code reference as well. Via the ADEPT platform, we are then able to egress this data to the wider marketplace through various avenues, which we will then talk through as part of this presentation. As Beth mentioned, I'd also like to touch briefly on privacy, as it's a question that always arises when we talk around this topic. And it's at the core of Weijo's philosophy of smart mobility for good. So consent for this data is handled between the OEM and the driver, who will grant their permission for the data to be collected at the point of purchase through the relevant terms and conditions. Now, Weijo only provides data that has been pre-consented through this method. And all of the data Weijo provide is fully anonymized and de-identified, so there is no ability to track an individual driver. We never egress uh, personally identifiable information, and we are fully compliant with all the relevant privacy legislation. So for here, over here, which in the EU, GDPR, and CCPA in the US. Hopefully that gives you some insight into how we collect and process the data. What I'd like to do now is pass back over to Beth uh, for the next slide. So Beth, over to you. Thank you, Sean. So 
I, I think it's always really important to look at the key metrics of any data set and understand what really sets this data apart and makes it unique from other sources on the market. Weijo has various key metrics that really enable organizations to tap into key areas of study and research that you know you might not have been able to before. And I'd like to cover a few of these on, on this slide. To begin with, Weijo data has an unparalleled accuracy of six decimal places from the vehicle. So if you was to imagine drawing a small circle around the vehicle, that is the radius of accuracy that we see and follow as the vehicle takes its trajectory. With an extremely high accuracy like this, it allows you to understand almost lane level precision, bi-directional flow of vehicles, U-turns, and very granular approaches to things like signals. The data also has a frequency of every one to three seconds. So every one to three seconds, you will see a new data point with updated attributes such as speed, heading, timestamp, and lat long, which allows you to see almost a breadcrumb trail of a vehicle's journey. High accuracy alongside high frequency of data has been incredibly powerful in the research done utilizing this data by universities such as Purdue University, where they have actively used this data for things like signal timing and optimization. This use case would be pretty hard to do with other sources on the market, as they might not have the granular point data that Weijo provides. A lot of agencies are familiar with mobile phone data, which makes up a lot of the current transportation data on the market. I do think it's a great source for bike and pedestrian information. However, sometimes it can be lacking in accuracy when you're wanting more granular vehicle and road information. Mobile phone data has a radius of 20 meters from the vehicle, which can include the sidewalk, bicyclists, public transport and multiple people in a vehicle at times. We have had feedback from customers and partners that mobile phone data can sometimes be a little too noisy and take a lot of post-processing, especially in downtown areas, to understand is that data point a person on the sidewalk or is it a vehicle? So by having a layer of connected vehicle data in a given area where you might have existing mobile phone data, it will allow you to see exactly how that traffic is flowing from a very high accuracy standpoint. Another way in which the data can be used is by overlaying Weijo data onto existing sensor information. So we know that government agencies spend budget on implementing roadside units, sensors and cameras along their corridors and main arterials. These sensors I think are vital and needed and do provide a good visual on certain parts of the roadway. A key word there is certain. Sensors have blind spots, right? It's, in, it's pretty hard to cover a large area and understand full vehicle trajectories just based off of roadside units and sensor data. Weijo has a coverage of 95% of US roadways, which includes the rural roads, residential roads, and even some unclassified trails and uh, areas. We can essentially bridge the gap between sensors and show you that full flow of traffic in any given area. This is a very common use case. Uh, universities, universities use this use case a lot, and I have worked with numerous organizations who use Weijo data and sensor data in, in conjunction. A final metric I'd like to touch upon on this slide is the ability to store this information and provide historical data to organizations to better plan and prepare their projects. So we have data going back to October 2019 until present day. This allows universities and organizations to understand things like the change in driver behavior over time, if projects have been successful before, during and after implementation, how has the pandemic affected how we travel? You know, historical data is really important in answering those key questions. Uh, we also do provide a live stream of data, which actually leads me perfectly onto our next slide. So like I mentioned before, Weijo is incredibly big data and we have two main sources of our source data. 
vehicle movements and driving events. So I'd now actually like to pass back over to Sean, who will kickstart the overview of our source data. Thanks, Beth. So as previously mentioned, Weijo has the ability to egress data through different methods. Um, Beth's going to give an introduction to our source data there, and this is our largest data set consisting of potentially billions of data points that we collect directly from vehicles and offers some of our most granular insights. Our vehicle movements product offers highly granular location and trajectory data, while our driving event select offering can give insights into driver behavior and what is happening on the roads. While we want to focus on these products for the purposes of this webinar, I would like to touch on some of our other egress products as we offer multiple different avenues for this data to make it as accessible as we can. So, as you'll see on screen, our intelligence products offer aggregated outputs based on our source data, but focusing on particular insights, such as traffic or journeys, and can be offered flexibly through multiple different methods in either historical or forward facing batch, or even potentially depending on the product in near real time if required. Our Weijo Studio platform offers access to a selection of our aggregate insights through an easy to use browser based interface without the need for any specialist knowledge or storage capability on the customer side. So it really opens up the benefits of these insights to a wide audience. And finally, Weijo have a number of key partners through whom customers can access and utilize our different data sets, which again, just opens up the potential of Weijo's data to that wider audience. For the purposes of today, however, we're going to examine Weijo's source data in more detail, starting with our vehicle movements data. So if Beth can just move on to the next slide, I'll dig in. Now, Weijo's vehicle movements offers a highly detailed understanding of journeys that are occurring for any particular US or indeed EU geography, giving insights into areas such as traffic flow, congestion, origin destination of vehicles uh, and speed profiles for any particular roadway. And it can be provided as a data batch for a particular time period going back to that October 2019 date, or even in a low latency near real time stream if it's desired. You can see on the slide examples of areas where some of our existing public sector partners are using this data. With millions of vehicles providing data points every one to three seconds and the ability to provide these to an end user in near real time, the data could be integrated quite easily into an existing traffic management system to provide an up to the minute view of what is happening on the roads. And because each vehicle provides its speed in the same frequency for those agencies wanting to understand speed profiles and compliance, this can also be used to build that picture. And all of this doesn't require any physical infrastructure or manual collection methods on the part of the end user. Now, because of the very specific location accuracy down uh, to a reminder to about three square meters, another popular use case is origin destination studies. So understanding the movement of vehicles around an area from the point of ignition on to ignition off. And as we'll see in some examples later, Vehicle movements is also beneficial in safety related use cases. So either in near real time to quickly identify incidents that have occurred and the wider effects on traffic or in a historical sense. So the product can provide for post incident analysis and better understanding. But what is vehicle movements? So if we can just flick over to the next slide, what we'll do is dig in a little bit more to that. So we've talked about some of the use cases, but let's look at the product specifically. Well, vehicle movements provides the complete trajectory for journeys, as mentioned from the point of ignition on to ignition off, with data points provided every three seconds as standard. To offer a simple analogy, it provides that breadcrumb trail of vehicle journeys from millions of vehicles all day, every day. The product itself will provide data points with a specific lat long down to six decimal places or yes, approximately three square meters. It'll provide timestamps in universal time and local time, along with the speed and heading at the point of capture. Every journey has a distinct journey ID that is consistent for all related data points from the time the vehicle ignition is switched on to the point it is physically switched off. 
And I'll stress the point physically because, as I get asked a lot, this is not affected by things like auto start, stop technologies, at signals or intersections. It has to be a physical switch off to terminate the journey. As I alluded to earlier, we can also enrich the data with location identifiers. So things like state, geohash and zip codes to make filtering easier when you're working with the data. We also provide demographic information as part of this data set. So enable the ability to distinguish things like the body type, model year and powertrain of each journey. So it is possible to compare journeys of say SUVs and pickups versus sedans, for instance or distinguished EV or hybrid cars within the data to understand how their behavior deviates from combustion vehicles. So if we can flick over to the next slide, what I'd like to do now is look at some visual examples of our vehicle movements data related to specific use cases. In this first example, this is a visual of Indiana that we've mapped our vehicle movements data to over the course of one hour. Now, I would stress that these are actual journeys from our data set. There's no simulated element to this particular example. We can see this accurately allows you to track individual vehicle trajectories with color providing differentiation of speed in this case. So it's possible to see the exact origin, trajectory and destination of each individual journey. So public agencies can use this data to understand things like traffic flow or congestion, road utilization, speed compliance for individual highways, or where population is traveling from and to for a given geography. Rather than being limited to insights for one particular location where infrastructure is present, the data can provide the holistic overview of the entire road network. Moving on to the next slide, our next example shows how it's possible to focus on a specific road. This visual shows the actual full journeys of vehicles that used a specific section of the I-95 near Baltimore um, over the course of several hours. As the time approaches morning rush hour peak, you'll see the increase in activity. And we're actually able to distinguish east and westbound journeys by color coding them appropriately in green or purple. Connected vehicle data enables a wide spectrum of road usage insight. Sensors and cameras may give an overview of vehicles using a roadway at a fixed point, but what they can't provide is the story of a vehicle's entire journey to aid in that understanding or they can't necessarily distinguish between things such as ice, internal combustion engine and EV vehicles to understand how their current road usage differs. And again, build that insight. The next slide provides um, an analysis of an actual incident using our vehicle movement data. So this was a pileup of 69 vehicles in Virginia in December, 2019, where thankfully no one was seriously injured. Due to poor visibility and busy rush hour traffic, a single collision had an enormous snowball effect. So on the visual, you can clearly see our movement data from the time of the incident demonstrate the slowing and stopping traffic on the bridge and how the back end of that queue moves backwards southeast as it builds up. Now agencies can use this data potentially delivered in under 60 seconds from the vehicle if needed to get near real time insight into incidents as they occur, understanding where the problems are, the effect on the road network and how best to reroute away from triple spots. Meanwhile, historical data can provide new perspectives for analysis and the ability to look at accidents and the wider effects through a different lens than just relying on traditional data sources. Moving on again to the next slide, our next example shows how data can be used in the signal timing and turning movement space. So this is an area where Purdue University in Indiana have done a lot of work utilizing our data to help enhance signal timing algorithms and identify split failures, where you may well be aware is where a vehicle is unable to traverse an intersection within two cycles. 
in the visual, which is an intersection in Las Vegas, our movement data clearly demonstrates how vehicles move through the intersection, but also clearly identifies where vehicles are stopping within the traffic queue and how fast they're able to get through. While there might be well be infrastructure at the intersection itself to assist in management, this likely can't provide a full view of the surrounding road network and how long vehicles are waiting in queuing traffic. This is why Purdue is using connected vehicle data rather than just relying on fixed infrastructure, again, for that holistic overview. Hopefully, this has given you some insights into our vehicle movements data and how it is being utilized in the public sector space to aid in mobility and safety. I'm going to hand back over to Beth now to talk further around connected vehicle insights. Beth, over to you. Thank you, Sean. So the next type of our source data is our driving events. Unlike vehicle movements, which Sean has just covered, driving events is delivered in a historical batch only. So we do not offer this as a live stream feed. And this is due to us collecting the events that have happened throughout the vehicle's journey at ignition off. We can still provide this, however, within a 24 hour period. So we could show you the events in an area from yesterday, today which I'm sure a lot of um, colleagues in the government space will agree is pretty quick when uh, comparing to uh, the time taken to get crash data. So we get a variety of different events from within the vehicle. The most popular event I see in the public sector is our harsh braking and rapid acceleration data. So we can tell you areas in a city or on a corridor that we see an unusually high amount of harsh braking. This is extremely important from a safety standpoint in being more proactive in understanding problematic areas, essentially before a crash has happened. We have done extensive work with Purdue University where they actually ascertain that with every 147 instances of harsh braking, this directly correlated to an incident. I always think how powerful would it be to have this information on a consistent basis to see how and where your crash zones change and develop. We know driving behavior has changed over the years, especially with the pandemic, and no crash zone stays the same for long. That's why I think it's important to understand why people are hard breaking and if there is something you can actively do to change and mitigate for this. Even though Weijo is a sample set of vehicles on the road, if we, for example, see an intersection with 10 to 15 harsh braking instances from different vehicles on a particular day, you can more than likely imagine that this, this is the generic behavior of a 100% sample on that intersection, meaning the harsh braking is being caused by a physical issue with the road network, maybe work zone influences, signal failures, or another generic factor that you could physically mitigate. There are also many other attributes that we provide in our driving events data set, aside from braking and acceleration insights. So you can see on screen there a list of attributes. You might not need them all. However, there are a few key ones that I would like to point out in regards to safety today, and that would be seatbelt change, wiper state change, and speed threshold change. Like vehicle movements on the left, we still provide the core attributes, but then we provide all of these different event types also. I think seatbelt change is important to understand areas that have an unusually high amount of unlatched seatbelt activity. Why is this? What causes people to unlatch seatbelts in typical areas? We provide this data to allow you to research driver behavior in certain areas and understand what can be better done from a safety perspective to improve this. For example, we have worked with an engineering firm in the past to understand where to put roadside messaging to encourage people to wear their seatbelts. I think wiper state change as well is a popular event, especially in states prone to hurricanes, heavy rain and flooding. With Florida unfortunately being prone to some of these harsh weathers, we have seen wiper state change being used to monitor driving behaviours and evacuation routes during natural disasters, heavy rain and flooding. 
Another interesting event to point out would be speed threshold change. So we see this, and this would allow you to see the major arterials that break an 80 miles per hour speed threshold on a consistent basis. Again, these metrics all fall back to the core focus of today's webinar, which is safety and mobility, and what government agencies and universities can do through research and decisions to better improve the road network and ultimately save lives. A visual I wanted to quickly show US Route 1 in Miami that has been known to be a troublesome road and calculated to have one of the highest fatal crash rates of any US road. Uh, you can see as I play through this video the amount of harsh braking and acceleration we see here on a typical day. You can also start to see the braking as an influence off Route 1 onto the residential streets and corridors that you wouldn't know about with ha without having this data. Imagine having this type of data over the course of six months to a year to understand what seasons are the most troublesome. Is there a particular or consistent day or time where the braking is higher? I think, um, oh, sorry about that. I think all of these questions essentially off the back of looking at this data will glean really great results uh, when looking at the physical road network and what can be changed to prevent you know inevitable crashes. I also wanted to just touch base on Orlando which we know obviously is a high tourist tra uh, tourist area and attraction making it troublesome from in for incidents so you can see throughout the video as the video populates clusters of harsh braking are accumulating in peak spots providing vital information obviously to a DOT city or county on what needs to be done to create these safer areas. Uh, another powerful statement from the research we've done with Purdue is that they found that one month of Weijo's harsh braking data substitutes four to five years of crash data. Hopefully we have given a great overview of the data that makes up the real backbone of all of our use cases, products and services. I would now like to run through a few visuals uh, and use cases pertinent to Florida, and then we will essentially close out the session for any Q&A. So Sean, if you would like to take the first visuals. Thank you, Beth. So to perhaps bring this data to life a little more and make it a little closer to home for everyone on this webinar, um, here is an actual day's worth of data last Wednesday, if anyone was wondering for the area around uh, Florida Atlantic University, which we've visualized just for everyone's information using GeoPandas within Databricks, which is one platform you could potentially use for handling our data. Now, this is a sample of journeys from our vehicle movements data for that day. And we've color coded the individual data points by the speed at the point the data point was captured. You can clearly distinguish how the speed varies along the different road types. And even though this is only a partial sample of one day's data, you can also see how this coverage along the majority of primary and secondary roads, and you can clearly see those individual journeys at the start and end points. If we just progress to the next slide, Beth, here is a slightly different view of the same area and time frame. This time looking at our driving events data. I wanted to focus on safety related events for this. So this image clearly shows our harsh braking, harsh acceleration and speed threshold events. Now from this image, it's clear to see the collections of hard braking and hard acceleration events in pink um, that are occurring around particular intersections during the course of the day. This enables agencies to start examining locations where there are potential safety concerns. Likewise, we can see consistent speed threshold events all along that I-95 over to the left, which is the indicating where a vehicle has gone above or dropped below 80 miles an hour. This helps build up a picture of where speed compliance is not optimal. Finally, if we just progress to the next slide, Let's look at journey start and end points, along with seatbelt latch and unlatch events for the location around the university. Now, from this map, we can clearly see there's a correlation between where journeys begin or finish and where seatbelts are being engaged or removed, i.e. the data points in a lot of cases are overlaid on another, one another. 
And that's entirely expected because it's normal behavior. It's also possible though, to see instances where there are isolated seatbelt events on roads away from any journey event. Now, these are indications of seatbelt non-compliance. Public agencies spend a large amount of resources on seatbelt awareness campaigns to drive this compliance. But one issue that they face is how do you measure return on investment when you're running an initiative like this? Well, one solution is by using connected vehicle data and then leveraging both historic and forward facing data sets for comparison, giving the ability to get insight into how successful campaigns are and show where there is a demonstrable increase in compliance. What I'd like to do now is just pass back over to Beth to run through some more visuals. Beth, back to you. Thank you, Sean. So one of the recent use cases we focused on in Florida regarding safety and mobility was around hurricane evacuation. Unfortunately, as we know, Hurricane Ian caused considerable amounts of damage and caused people to flee their homes in search of safety. We were actually approached by various organizations who wanted to look at our data throughout the hurricane as we had a consistent feed showcasing evacuation routes and traffic flow during the hurricane. During harsh weathers, roadside units tend to not be strong enough or powerful enough to, to stay maintained or connected and can actually be completely damaged by the storm. So by having a direct insight to the movement of vehicles, we can actively see the safest routes out of danger and also better prepare and plan for future events. So what you can see on screen here is September the 28th, 2022, when people started to realize they needed to, to evacuate. So on this particular day in this small polygon area here highlighted, we saw around 2000 journeys. And you can start to see with the speed, the darkest red color of speed being the highest speed, all the way down to the darkest color of blue being the slowest speed and complete stop. So you can really see that buildup of congestion onto the main arterial leaving Tampa in this area and also start to see where people are evacuating to for shelter. So nearby supermarkets, Walmart, for example. And we'll start to see now over the course of the days during the hurricane, how this visual changes and evolves. As we move now into the coming days of the hurricane, just one day after the previous image here, we can now visibly see slower speeds on the interstate and extreme congestion on the on-ramps of people trying to evacuate. There is now no dark red colors of no high speeds. So this will tell you visually and from a data standpoint that you know there's congestion here and people are really trying to, to evacuate. You can also see the nearby shopping center now more populated with people taking shelter. And we have seen that number of journeys from the previous day jump up to almost 3000 within this small polygon. If we now move forward one more day, we now see a, an absolute drastic difference. Um, we can now see a huge influx of people who have evacuated to the nearby shopping malls and also steady congestion with high speeds on the inner lanes of the interstate and again congestion on the on and off ramps. I think it's also worth noting that now we are seeing an average of 13,000 journeys just in this small polygon comparison to two days prior when we saw 2,000 journeys. So I think this really allows you to see how connected vehicle data provides a real in-depth view of the movement of people and can really align to real world scenarios. Imagine having this information as a live feed during the hurricane. So you could see the roads that need opening for evacuation, that need more monitoring from a traffic operations standpoint, and also where do people tend to evacuate to in these key cities? And can anything be done in the future to make them more accessible? For example, do the roads need widening? Do we need to increase parking lot sizes, etc.? So if I was to quickly jump from the beginning visual to this one, you can clearly see that difference. This is also something else I'd like to just point out in terms of how accurate our data is. You can see a, a buildup, and this is again during the evacuation period. You can see a buildup here from an intersection entering a gas station. So we see extremely slow speeds, and the, the traffic becomes more free flowing here. So it's a real backup and queue uh, of congestion up to 500 meters. 
you know, this level of point granularity is not easily accessible on the market currently and is something that will allow DOTs to do an in-depth study using connected vehicle data. I would like to also quickly touch upon another real world scenario that I thought I would bring to, to this call. Uh, again, taking it back to safety and mobility, this final use case is looking at a crash that took place recently in Tampa involving five semi-trailers carrying stock. All lanes were closed after the crash, causing a real flow down effect and back up on the highway and also some near misses and secondary crashes as well. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Uh, and we wanted to kind of look at our data to see what that looked like from, from a data standpoint. As you can see on screen here, I have taken a before and after visual of our data during the crash. When I first looked at this, I was confused uh, by the disparate data points on the day of the crash. When we investigated this more, uh, we found that this to be an off-road trail that vehicles were using to avoid the congestion and danger on the road ahead of them. This was a very powerful thing to see as it really showcases the impact our accuracy has in real world scenarios. Do government agencies know that vehicles take these off-road trails in these areas when crashes happen? Could this be also a safety issue for people walking and cycling the trails? And what could be done to prevent and improve this moving forward? This is also another overview of the activity one week before the crash and the day of. You can clearly see the difference in the routes taken by vehicles to avoid the main um, incident zone and what effect this has from a congestion and flow down standpoint. As mentioned, we store all data historically and this use case is a perfect example to understand how drivers react to major incidents what their behaviours look like, and if there could be anything that the DOT or government agencies can do better to prepare for future incident and events. Very quickly, I looked at this from a numerical standpoint, uh, and we can clearly see the impact from, from a data standpoint as well. So one week before the incident, on a typical day on that highway, we saw around 175 vehicles producing events, such as harsh braking and rapid acceleration. The day of the crash, that number jumps up to 811 vehicles showcasing events, which clearly tells me that the crash had a major impact on the driving behaviour of vehicles affected from the initial incident. And to round out uh, the, the discussion today, I would like to hand over to Sean, who will touch upon some of our current partners uh, within Wejo. Thank you, Beth. Um, so we just wanted to finish by highlighting some of the agencies that are using Weijo data right now to improve safety and mobility on the roads. So we've mentioned Purdue University in Indiana during this presentation. They would certainly be, in my opinion, a good example of advocates of how Weijo data can be used in this space. Many of you may be familiar with some of their work around signal timings, um, where Professor Bullock and his team have utilized Weijo data to develop improved modeling. But they have also extensively used our hard braking data to impact, uh, to look at safety and identify areas uh, for Indiana DOT that have safety related problems. They've published several papers around this, which would make great follow up reading if you're interested in learning more. I'd also call out Connecticut Transportation Institute and Texas A&M Transportation Institute as other institutions we have excellent relationships with and who are leveraging Weijo connected vehicle data for the benefit of their respective DOTs. For example, in Connecticut, they are planning to use our products to enhance their own roadway safety management system and crash data repository. For Texas A&M, they are using that data across multiple fields, including how people travel and road safety assessments. Both institutions actually did a, a webinar with us recently, explaining in more detail the real life use cases of this data. And I would absolutely encourage you to check it out on demand if you want to know more about how universities are using these insights. Maricopa Association of Governments partnered with us to leverage connected vehicle data to understand driver behaviors, congestion, and safety. Traditionally reliant on expensive infrastructure, MAG wanted to gain a more holistic view of their entire network, which our data could provide. They were extremely pleased with how our data gave new insight beyond their traditional data sources and could be used in their own words as a credible and critical benchmarking tool when comparing data sources internally. 
These are just some of the examples of how our data is being used today. You can see others on the slide for which collateral is available to, have, to discover more about their use. But as we approach time on this presentation, I would just like to pass back to Beth one last time to wrap things up. Thank you, Sean. So, yeah, thank you, Sean, for that fantastic overview. Uh, yeah, and I suppose that that comes to the end of our time today, uh, the end of the webinar presentation. I suppose now we can uh, open up to, to any Q&A to, to round the, the discussion out. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. And uh, there, there are actually quite a few questions. Uh, some of them are related, so I'm going to try my best to combine some of the similar questions that we gave some time. Um, there's been a lot of inquiries about, uh, you know, what is the current sample size? What percentage of the vehicles are you covering? Uh, and also kind of related to that is how do you determine the, the market penetration rate of connected vehicles uh, in, in the study area? Um, and, and any differences in the driver behavior. Yeah, and, and I can start with that and Sean, please feel free to add a little bit. So we get asked about this question of penetration and density a lot, almost in every call. And we understand, you know, it's, it's a pretty new data source and that, that concern might come up here and there. So essentially our penetration differs based on state and population. So we do see a higher density in areas like Florida, Texas and California. Uh, luckily in Florida, we do have a really great penetration rate within air, within some areas we're seeing around five to 8%. But we have done extensive research with universities who we currently partner with, where they've compared our data to 100% sample from ground truth loop detectors, etc. And they found that even with lower penetrations, sometimes 2%, we always follow that 100% sample and that real world analysis. So wherever they will see congestion, Ouija will con see congestion. Uh, wherever they will see longer travel times, Ouija will see this. So we haven't found it to be too much of an issue. Uh, and Sean, I don't know if you agree with me on that or you can add any more to that. Um, but yeah, I would appreciate your, your input with that as well. No, absolutely, Beth. And I think you've given a great summary there. Um, I, I would just add to it as, yeah, it typically sort of three to 7% across the US, depending on location is, is normal. But the key point with this sort of data is you don't need anywhere near 100% to start drawing insights. If we look back to that visual we showed of the accident in Virginia, that 69 car pileup, we don't need data from every 69 car, of all those 69 cars to see what's happening. You could see just from the data points we had where the vehicles were stopping. You could tell where the traffic was going back to. You could see when the vehicles are starting to move through again. So the key thing, as Beth said, is a penetration rate of 3% or more is more than enough for statistical analysis. And that's borne out by the institutions such as Purdue, such as Texas A&M that are using our data right now. Excellent. And I got... Uh... I guess two small questions uh, in the, from the audience. Uh, one is regarding whether the data is being collected on demand or outsourced to a third party agency. Uh, the other one uh, on the unrelated note is uh, how is harsh breaking being defined? Uh, and uh, any parameters that you adjust to, to fit the definition? For example, maybe a different area might be defined a little bit different. I can jump in on this one to answer the harsh breaking question, Beth, if you like, and again, feel free to add to it, but, um, yeah, of course. No problem. So, um, our harsh breaking and harsh acceleration thresholds are defined by our principal OEM partner. Uh, we use their thresholds for defining it and those thresholds to make them explicitly is a harsh breaking event is de uh, generated when a, the vehicle's deceleration is greater than minus 2.67 meters per second squared. A, harsh, a hard acceleration event is generated when the vehicle's acceleration is greater than plus 2.64 meters per second squared. So we use that as a defining moment. It's not possible at the moment to adjust those thresholds easily because we don't calculate them internally from raw acceleration values that we get a data point from the vehicle itself when that event is generated. But they are a very good indicator of where those safety related events are uh, coming from. I, Beth, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that at all. No, that was a great overview. Um, I think in regards to the first question that, that David asked, so is this data collected on demand or outsourced or collected 24-7? So the data is collected 24-7 from the OEMs that we partner with. Uh, like I mentioned 
earlier in the call, you can receive this data as a live stream. So the data is consistently feeding into our partners uh, and feeding internally into Wejo. So uh, we, we don't outsource anything. We, we get that data feeding in, into our systems 24-7. Excellent. Uh, and kind of as a follow up, uh, mostly the newer vehicles uh, from certain manufacturers. I, I have rented a few of those these vehicles that give you a little disclaimer at the top of the by where the the sunglasses holders are. Uh, the little sticker a disclaimer saying that you're being tracked uh, for for data, and uh, if you would like to uh, disable this function, there is a button you can press. Uh, is this typically where you get the data from? Yeah, so um, a lot of vehicles do have that option to opt in or opt out. So mm -hmm. we do understand that, you know, p drivers might not want to share the data, they might right. want to opt out. So we do see that fluctuation here and there. Um, some OEMs will provide this in their contracts uh, when you purchase a vehicle about data sharing. It, it, de it definitely differs based on the OEM. I would say though that the amount of conversations that we have with multiple different OEMs, we're always increasing our volume. So even if we see a, a fluctuation of people opting out, like you mentioned in, on the dashboard, we see an increase in volume from other OEMs, if that makes sense. So there might be fluctuations, but we are always consistently seeing growth as every vehicle that now comes off the manufacture line is typically connected. Uh, and, and it will be like that moving forward uh, as we move into the future. And excellent. And um, since nobody else is you know, writing more questions. I, I have a rather important question to ask pertaining to future uh, uh, vehicle technologies. Uh, myself, uh, in, in my research group, uh, we do a lot of uh, data collection, a lot of control experiments, and especially trajectory data uh, collection for vehicles that have certain degrees of uh, the uh, uh, certain degrees of automation. Uh, for example, uh, you know, with adaptive cruise control, lane keeping. Uh, we've been purchasing a lot of equipment. We've been using, uh, you know, technical equipment, mostly originally designed for racing. Uh, we collect data from the onboard, uh, onboard diagnostics unit, uh, uh, as long, uh, also, uh, uh, as well as the, uh, yeah, installing high precision GPS uh, to track the vehicle's trajectories. Uh, we do a lot of that data collection and put a lot of effort into that, but I feel like there's a lot of parameters that the manufacturers are hiding. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've actually rented some cars equipped with level two automation or driver assistance technology with adaptive cruise control, lane keeping, and so on and so forth. Uh, they actually display certain parameters, such as how closely you're following the vehicle in front of you. Um, is that something in the works in terms of integration of new data related to autonomous driving. For example, if I wanted to study if adaptive cruise control uh, or how other manufacturers call it, there are different names in different parts of the world, uh, mm -hmm. how is that going to really affect uh, safety? Is that preventing a lot of unsafe driving behavior uh, that would otherwise happen? So I was wondering if, if that set of data could be available, maybe not now, but maybe soon. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a great question, David. I think we're always looking to enhance some of the attributes that we have. And we know that uh, different OEMs obviously will provide different attributes when it comes to driving events. So we have looked at things like, you know, lane assist and airbag deployment, things like that, things that we might not currently have access to. And we're always looking to, to, to add on these. So essentially, as our OEM partnerships grow, these could be opportunities. But yeah, absolutely, we're, we're always looking to, to partner and, and, you know, enhance those attributes that we get from the vehicles, because we understand that each attribute is so important from a, from a safety perspective, right? Even looking at uh, tire friction on the road, right, in certain weathers and things like that. So there's there's lots of different sensors that we are consistently looking at, uh, and definitely, you know, we've got the cogs moving in the background with with some of those. Yeah, um, and uh, since we have a minute left, I just have one quick question that just popped up. Um, so uh, somebody in the audience asked, uh, "Is it typical now that every pretty much every OEM is signing up for this uh, data sharing?" arrangement or are there small niche brands that are still not getting on board with this? Yeah, and typically when we come to, to speaking about the OEM, so 
the OEMs obviously have different approaches when it comes to, to data and things like that. So we are obviously on board now with four OEMs in the States who we, we can't publicly name. I think that might have been one question in the chat too. At this point, yeah. we can't publicly publicly name them, but um, we, we are on board with those. Uh, and, you know, as we are moving towards a more autonomous and connected lifestyle, I think a lot of OEMs are really starting to get on board with the idea of data sharing. Uh, and I think it's it's only a positive, right? Because the more volume, the more information we have and the safer the roads will be essentially. So um, I think we, Joe, are just very thankful that we're kind of at the forefront of this movement. We've got great partnerships. Uh, we've made some great footprint uh, in the US uh, and you know that's allowing us now to branch out to places like Europe and, uh, and the UK so yeah it's great. Excellent um, and uh, I'll hand uh, over to Mackenzie and hopefully I'll see uh, both of you at TRV this coming January. Yes, we will be there. We will have a booth, so it would be great. I can see there's quite a lot of people on the call today. If you are at TRB, uh, please feel free to come over, uh, see us at the booth, and we'll have uh, more of an in, you know, an in-person chat. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I am attending the TRB, so I hope to get to talk to you in person and learn a little bit more about uh, you and the company more so than what you guys uh, presented today. So I'm looking forward to that. But I did want to thank both of you for presenting for ITE student chapter and FMRI today. Uh, you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. It, it, generally, I echo what Beth said. Very, very much a privilege to present today. Thank you both. I really appreciate for your time. And I would like to thank also the audience that attended this FMI meeting. We are looking forward to see you in person, Bethany and Son. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of your day, everybody. You too, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you everyone for attending.